Our speaker is Ben Weed uh, from Venusburg, owner of Weed Sash and the Work. It's a woodworking shop in Venusburg Falls, specializing in window restoration, reproduction, custom doors, cabinetry, and molding. In business since 2003, Weed Sash and Door has worked on numerous historic buildings throughout North Vermont. And you'll hear about this very important one to use for the Opera House. Would you please welcome Ben Reed. Thank you. Not sure if the microphone, can everybody hear me all right? No. Test one, test one, two. Hello? <laughs> I don't have any control over it. Hello? Check, test, test. Is that okay? All right, thank you very much uh, for having me here, the uh, UVM OLLI program. Uh, as John said, my name is Ben Weed and uh, grew up and live in Enosburg Enosburg Falls, I have a woodworking shop there. And uh, today I want to talk about the, uh, the Enosburg Opera House. Sorry here. Uh, this is the Enosburg Opera House, a picture taken a few weeks ago. Uh, largely unchanged from the way it was when it was built 130 years ago. Uh, it's been an important part of Enosburg's history for that 130 years, cultural and civic center for Enosburg Falls and its surrounding communities, and continues to be so today. Uh, today's presentation is going to focus on restoring the building's stained glass windows, uh, and also is going to take some time to talk about a little bit of family history and history related to the Opera House as well. Uh, some of you, of course, are probably familiar with the Opera House. Uh, I'm sure there's people who've attended various plays and meetings and concerts and such at this, uh, at this venue. Uh, all right, so uh, I just thought I'd show you a picture of, of the shop and a picture of inside the shop my business, Weed Sash and Door. Uh, as John said, I've been open since 2003, doing custom woodworking uh, with a specialty in, in windows and doors. And um, I actually have a little visual aid here of one of the things that separates window and door work from some of the other types of woodworking. And that's the mortise and tenon joint. Uh, actually, this probably could be passed around if people want to want to check it out. Uh, and it's, the mortise is a square hole that's been mortised into the piece to fit the tenon. And so all window construction, uh, particularly older window construction, but even new window construction today uses, utilizes that joint and it's pinned. And multi-light windows, single light windows, all of the types of windows use that type of joinery, which is very strong and fairly easy to assemble and work. So actually, uh, if you guys, you know, want to check that out and pass it around, that's a good example of that. Uh, for me, woodworking wasn't the first, uh, my first career actually went to Vermont Technical College and uh, for automotive technology and worked as a mechanic, uh, you know, an auto mechanic for about six years. But this shop that you see here, which is located on the Weed property, which had been a family farm for many generations, uh, and that building actually was the milk house and milking parlor, uh, was, was there. My father had, had started a similar business there about 40 years ago. Uh, and he, he converted that milk house into a working, functioning woodworking shop and actually uh, had needed storm windows for his own house and being fairly industrious, he decided to make his own and that actually was the beginning of an idea of his to actually get into making windows and doors and start a shop, which he did and it, it, it turned into a fairly successful business. This was in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, Unfortunately, he had some, some pretty serious back problems and uh, had to stop. But the shop remained there the, the whole time I was growing up and my mother actually also used it. So there's a bit of history of woodworking in the family. Uh, she has a woodworking business called Jewel, of, Jewel Wood of Vermont that makes uh, very nice wooden jewelry, uh, barrettes and earrings and such. Uh, so after I started the business, uh, there's actually been a number of times where people have brought me 
a window that maybe my father had made back when he was doing it that was rotten or damaged and I had to make again essentially so it's, it's been interesting in that way. Uh, so I take this time to maybe show a couple examples of some of the stuff that I do. This is a, a screen door for a camp on uh, Lake Champlain with the hummingbird cut out. I don't know if everybody can see it from way back there, but uh, uh, that scroll thought out of this, this rail. And uh, that actually is the third one that they made for the same role of camps. I think it was kind of a keeping up with the Joneses type of a situation. <laughs> I'd made a, uh, a sailboat cut out door and the next year was contacted by the neighbors and they wanted one that was a blue heron. Uh, and, then this, and then this hummingbird one, and actually I'm gonna be making one next spring for uh, essentially another camp on that same road that's gonna be a loon. Uh, so those are, those are interesting. Those are kind of a nice, uh, a, a pretty, pretty nice little door. Um, this is some custom cabinetry, entry room, uh, entry room cabinetry. You can sit on the bench and store shoe storage and such. It's a good example of uh, cabinetry and all the finishing that, and building that goes into that. Uh, this is the 1891 brick schoolhouse in Georgia, Vermont. Uh, over the course of a few years, we restored all of the windows in that building. I think in this picture, there's still a couple that haven't been done over here, but uh, and that's a really neat historic building on Route 7 in Georgia Center. Um, so that's that type of work as well. This is the Calkins Farmhouse, which is the Intervale Center office down in Burlington. If any of you have been down to the Burlington Intervale. Uh, and that's a reproduction door and screen door for the original that uh, actually was not particularly rotten, but had been extensively chewed by some long ago dog. Uh, uh, on the inside, you know, and actually to, such, to the point where restoring it was actually not really feasible, and this is their office too, so it needed to be a good functioning door. So reproduction was, was in order for that. Um, uh, custom oak kitchen, a home in Montgomery. This picture unfortunately doesn't really show the whole extent of the kitchen, but, uh, you know, so we do get into uh, cabinetry, and uh, all of that related moldings and, and some of the more you know, standard woodworking that's out there. Um, this is a reproduction eyebrow window. These are an interesting type window. Uh, over the years, I've done a fair amount of curved and arched uh, window sash. Uh, anytime we're in the, in the business, if you're talking about the frame of the window that the glass goes in, it's called the sash. Um, which, which is where the, the business name comes from, Weed Sash and Door. Uh, so, but curved, curved windows are, uh, anything curved is a challenge in woodworking, uh, in any type of you know, metalworking or woodworking, but uh, in doing any type of joints, related joints and fitting of, of all the pieces is uh, quite a bit more labor intensive. And these are some uh, reproduction entry doors for a home in Montgomery, uh, late 1800s. Uh, the others were in really poor condition, and so these are solid hard maple doors. The only difference with these from the originals was uh, that they had insulated glass uh, in them, but otherwise the hardware is period and, and everything is, is exactly as it was. Uh, I oftentimes have custom knives made to match moldings. These have moldings in the panels. Um, you send a, send a piece of molding down to a knife grinder and they'll match your exact molding. It's really the only way you can stay accurate with, with all of these different shapes. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to uh, just do, do a few slides that show kind of a quick window restoration process. Um, and this is the Enosburg Masonic Hall. Uh, sits right next to the park in Enosburg Falls. Actually used to be on the park, but was moved uh, and it started its life as a church. So, some fairly interesting history about this building. Uh, but anyway, where it sits now, uh, they're undergoing window restoration. I'm actually working there currently, continuing window restoration there. Uh, but this, we're in the process of removing this large half round window, which is eight, eight feet across and about four feet tall. Uh, pretty, you know, challenging to handle. 
so we'd use the man lift actually to put up these braces right here because the window was just about ready to fall out, <laughs> essentially. That's, uh, that's what those are for, just so that the window could not accidentally fall out of the opening as we were removing it. Uh, and so here's a picture of the window out and safely down on the, on the floor. Um, you know, it's quite a process to carefully get it out of there, and it was in extremely poor condition. The whole bottom section of the window was rotten and falling apart. Uh, so keeping it from kind of just falling apart in your hands was, was a, a challenge. Uh, this is a picture of the window back in the shop. That's my, my dad actually holding the window there. Uh, you can see it's, it, needs, it needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of restoration work. And, um, so here's a, a quick picture of the window as it's undergoing repairs, uh, the whole bottom rail being replaced, a lot of work in the center here, uh, various amounts of wood that had to be added. Things typically have shrunk a lot over the years. One of the reasons it probably was falling out uh, and just all kinds of repairs to what are called the muntins, the small bars that make up the multi-light window. Uh, just, just really extensive amount of repairs. Here's a picture of the repaired frame. You can see all the new, all the new pieces is getting ready to be stained. This is going to be stain matched to the old uh, sort of orange colored wood that's developed over the years. And is that all wood or is, is that some of that metal? Iron? This is all wood. Everything here is wood. Yep, these are all, uh, you know, these were, these are quite a challenge to, this type of window to make from scratch is really a challenging window. You have a lot of curved, lots and lots of curved pieces that are at different, uh, you know, different curves depending on how far out you are and, and so forth. I didn't have to replace any of these pieces. Uh, there was a lot of work to do in the center and the rail and tightening up and fixing a lot of the joints, but in general, I didn't have to get into that. But that is all wood. Everything there is is wood. Um, so, and this is you know the glass. Uh, one other thing in restoration, it's my habit to always take the windows when they're at this point, when they're a bare, a bare window, uh, back to their opening. Especially something like this. This had to be refitted to its opening. Uh, the bottom rail is left a little wide so that you can trim and fit and make sure that when that window goes back in there, uh, that it's, it comes back for the final time, you're not gonna have any issues with it going in there and you know, scraping or having to do anything to the window when it's finished painted and ready to go in. So after it gets sort of test fitted and comes back to the shop, that's when the glass will go back in, the glass is puttied, any broken glass is replaced uh, with, with, the, with the absolute best match that you can do with the glass. Um, and so then the next picture is the window restored and back in. So, you know, um, but the, the, the process from start to finish on that is, uh, particularly with this window, uh, is really, really extensive. Um, you know, so a number of these panes are original, some are not. Some had already been replaced. This building suffered from a lot of um, you know, I think people throwing stones and stuff like that, if they had actually put plexiglass over the front of most of these windows that had become faded and cloudy and it just, you know, uh, being able to not have any of that anymore, it just looks, uh, it looks great now. All right. Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about a piece of history that's uh, really important to Enosburg, but also for the Opera House. And uh, that's the history of the Spavincure Company. I'm not sure if any of you are, anybody here familiar with Kendall Spavincure in Enosburg Falls? Yeah, okay. Um, it's, you know, it really, really was, a, was an important part of Enosburg's history. Kind of an interesting one. I mean, that was at the height of the patent medicine sort of snake oil salesman era, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, so anyway, Dr. Bernie Kendall uh, owned a drugstore on Main Street in Innsbruck Falls, and this has been in the early 1870s. Um, and he, he had access, of course, to a lot of current medicines and so forth that he carried. But he started, uh, I'm, I'm assuming because he had a horse that was suffering from this problem, 
started to work on a, on a cure for what was called spavins, and that was a condition of the ankle bone or, or what they call the hind hock on horses um, that caused, you know, I think was a pretty common issue. And so he, you know, he, he started working on his own concoctions and apparently he, he finally did land on one that was quite beneficial and uh, he started to manufacture it there and uh, start selling it and it was pretty popular. And, uh, you know, eventually became quite popular and after a few years, uh, he went along like that for a while, but after a few years, he ended up uh, wanting to kind of expand and took on some uh, business partners at that time. Uh, Carmine Marsh, Olin Merrill, and Moses Purley. Uh, some of those names are still, are still common in town. Uh, and these fellows were a little bit more business-minded and had cash that could be you know, injected into the business. And, uh, things really did start taking off. They started manufacturing it in a different building and uh, you know, it was being bought, it was a very popular product locally and, and a little bit in New England. Uh, by 1879, it was decided to construct a new building and this still stands today in Innsbruck, North Main Street. You guys, uh, people probably have seen this building on, on a regular basis. It doesn't look like that anymore, <laughs> uh, condition-wise anyway. Um, but so at the time, this building was was really quite a quite a modern building. There was an elevator, a big steam boiler. Uh, you know, they had laboratories, packing rooms, uh, shipping rooms. Uh, you know, of course, the building was not built in today's sort of factory style. It was still more of like a I'm not sure how you, what you would call it. You know, more of, more of still just a building, three floors, four floors. Um, and one of the other things was printing presses. They started to go into doing their own advertising, extensive advertising, with uh, actually quite an impressive printing press set up right in-house. Uh, so that was, that was quite interesting. Uh, so uh, I've had an opportunity actually to walk through basically all of that building. I've done some window restoration there. Actually, these windows right here a few years back uh, kind of in the bottom of the tower. But in the process of looking at some of the other work, had a chance to walk around in there. Um, and there's still a lot of the shafting and flat belting that originally was in there that ran all the printing presses and stuff. It's uh, not a place kids would want to be running around probably when it was running, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. A lot, of the, a lot of the original, some of the original machinery is still in there. Uh, and actually, when I was working on the building, I had the opportunity to go up into the very top of the tower to look at some of the windows up there. I wouldn't recommend going up there to anybody. <laughs> it's uh, super narrow, really questionable stairs, pitch black until you get in the top. Uh, and the floor up there also is less than, less. I mean, this is a place where just nobody's done anything for 100, 140 years. Uh, but, but anyway, so that's, that's it. My, my work sometimes takes me into some interesting places like that. It'll be windows up in some attic that nobody goes in or wants to go in uh, occasionally. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, so during this time, the Kendall Company, you know, being sort of the age of patent medicine, they expanded. So they weren't just selling medicine for horses anymore. Uh, they were getting to all these other elixirs and tonics and cures. You know, uh, Dr. B.J. Kendall's pectoral elixir for coughs, colds, and all lung troubles. Dr. B.J. Kendall's tonic and blood purifier. Dr. B.J. Kendall's blackberry balsam for dysentery and all summer com complaints. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, 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 again, this was, this was the era, it, really, it was before the, uh, the Food and Drug Act and some of the other things that we, <laughs> take for granted now. Um, and it, it was, uh, a lot of their medicine had a lot of alcohol in it. I've, I've heard rumors there that there was, was opium and some other stuff in some of these formulations too, but uh, alcohol without a doubt. And there was one popular formula called Quick Relief that uh, <laughs> contains 72% alcohol. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I imagine you did 
feel quite a bit better there, <laughs> briefly, uh, you know. So, uh, but, but despite the success of the company at this time, Dr. Kendall himself had some disagreements with, uh, with the other men and in 1884 sold his now quarter share to the other men, uh, actually for quite impressive sum of $100,000 at that time, which in 1884 would be a lot. Uh, the company continued to expand after him. They actually got even bigger, uh, particularly with their advertising. And uh, this is a nice example here of a poster. This is actually a poster in my house that was my aunt's. I took a picture of it. Um, that's the building in the bed. They, they actually had some really nice full color printing presses in there. Um, you know, it, it, they're, they're quite impressive actually. Really, really nice. I grew up in my parents' house. We had one of those too. I'm really used to looking at that poster. Um, so this extensive campaign, they used to send out teams of horses every spring. I think it was 18 or 20 uh, teams of horses with two salesmen. They didn't really carry, they really didn't carry much product. They mostly had pamphlets. Uh, there was a popular book uh, by Dr. B.J. Kendall that was being printed on horses. Um, mostly, you know, you can see here, this is a picture taken uh, in Omaha, Nebraska. They're, they're plastering posters on the side of a barn. That was kind of a common thing back then. Uh, but they mostly, they had samples. They would carry samples of the product and they would, uh, uh, mostly just get the word out there all the way out west to the Rockies. So uh, between that and just the new facility and everything, they really, you know, for the next really into, uh, into the teens, into the, into the uh, around 1920, they actually were really quite, you know, booming and selling a lot of material. So uh, with, this, with this success, the, the uh, principles of the company were interested in, in you know, helping the town of Venusburg, and they were responsible for some of the first sidewalks in town, uh, the first water system in Venusburg Falls. Uh, it was called Kendall Water, and uh, they also later there was a, a hydroelectric plant put in by them, and some of the first uh, I think Venusburg had some of the first street lighting for a small town in. Uh, in New England, I believe, if, if I had read right. Um, but that brings us to the Opera House. This uh, was one of their earlier projects. They, the company itself had the Enosburg Opera House built in 1892 for the sum of $10,000, which, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a large building. This is a large, large building. It's, it really kind of boggles the mind that it could be constructed for that. I mean, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't probably do the doors for that. You couldn't, you couldn't do the doors for that. Uh, so uh, at the time, it was considered one of the most commodious and handsome public halls in the state, and it has seating for 600. Uh, in the early years, it was, it was very busy with dances, variety shows, uh, meetings, various, and the school, the school used it quite extensively too. At that time, they didn't really have any uh, a gym or facilities. Uh, and actually, I remember my grandfather, who would have graduated in the late 30s, talking about playing basketball at the Opera House. And uh, I thought that was interesting with all the stained glass windows in there. <laughs> but but uh, later learned that actually, and they're still there in the hardwood floor, uh, probably, probably about three feet out from where the windows are. There's steel plates every so often mortised flush, you know, they're flush with the floor, and those actually, netting came down and attached to those. So the windows were protected. Uh, I'm sure they got hit once in a while, but. Um, so that was interesting, and that's, that's a pretty small room really for basketball, but at the time that was, that was the way that it, it was. So in 1947, the, uh, the high school gym was built, uh, an actual high school gym was built, and that really actually was kind of the beginning of the deterioration of the Opera House for a period. It still was occasionally used, town meetings, things like that, but the school really was not using it much anymore. And from the late 40s all the way until about the mid 70s, um, you know, it, it just kind of fell by the wayside essentially. And uh, the condition slowly deteriorated. Um, 
And, and that's uh, in the 1970s, I guess in the mid-1970s, there was a, was a group that finally started to say, hey, you know, this building is, is, really, is really an amazing building and we don't want to let it deteriorate to the point where we lose it. Um, and that, at that time, some grant money was, was gotten together and some original work was done, some of the first things to really start kind of turning the building around. Um, and actually, at that time, my father was in business and he was, uh, he was, he was asked to come in and do some window work uh, in combination with uh, Phil and Carolyn Browns, who are uh, stained glass people. And so they tackled a bunch of the windows that were in, in poor condition at that time. So it was interesting that my father, about 40 years ago, worked on the windows in the opera house. He didn't do any of the stained glass work, but he did uh, a lot of the, the wood-related sash repair and window repair. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, and so fast forward to 2012, and then uh, I was, had been in business for a number of years and was asked, they got some grant, the opera house received grant money to start tackling the windows again, essentially. And so I started to work on those with the bronzes again, actually, and they, uh, most of the windows did not need a lot of stained glass panel repair at that time. They needed extensive restoration, but not, not too much actual stained glass work. Uh, and so a large, uh, I think uh, six of the windows were tackled at that time. So in 2020, the Innisburg Opera House received the Paul Brun uh, Historic Revitalization Grant for the sum of 50,000. Um, and that was gonna go towards window restoration and uh, painting the entire building, which is, which is quite large, so that's quite a project. Um, and uh, for my work and for the Opera House work and, and, and any of this restoration work that I've shown an example of, uh, if it's historic preservation, it has to follow the uh, Secretary of the Interior's uh, standards for historic preservation. You know, you kind of can't just go at it Totally, you know, there's certain guidelines that have to be followed in terms of materials used, practiced as used. They always want you to save absolutely everything you can, any parts and pieces of the window that are salvageable, you know, to, to, to do that, practices with the painting and all that. So it, it's a handy thing both for reference, but it also, you know, it are guidelines that you need to follow. So. Um, Here's, uh, okay, this is the Opera House now. And here's a picture of the stained glass windows in the Opera House. So in the main hall, there's 11 of these. Uh, they're all uh, double hung style. They're big double hung windows, meaning the bottom can open. Originally the bottom can open and the top can come down and the transom window above those. And that actually used to be able to be opened as well. Um, there originally was a weight and pulley system. I don't know if anybody has that still in their house, you know. It was very common at the time, especially for big heavy windows like this. Uh, and actually it was not a bad system. They, a lot of them you could, you could very easily just, you know, they were weighted just about neutral so you could you know, open them quite well. Um, one thing that I hoped that I could have found about these windows was who originally built them. And I have not been able to find that information out. I'm not sure who originally constructed these stained glass panels or the, the wooden sash that they went into. Um, it, it, so unfortunately, I don't know who made the windows originally. Uh, here's a picture of inside the, the, uh, the main hall. You can see the picture, the, uh, some of the windows. And another view of the stage, windows down both sides, and then down at the other end opposite of the stage. So here's a pretty good picture of the condition of some of the windows when I got started. Uh, you know, the windowsill in this case was, was essentially almost nothing left of it. Most of them weren't that bad, but this one was, was quite bad. Stained glass panels in very poor condition. Um, the transom window was already removed from this one. Uh, I can't remember exactly why, but there was, there was issues. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of what things look like before restoration. And I thought I'd just do a quick picture of after. So, um, you know, in this case, extensive repair around the sill, all the windows have been removed, gone back to the shop and restored and back in. So it's uh, usually a, a, a pretty noticeable <laughs> change. So uh, to, go, to go from the first picture to the second, 
is quite a process. You know, it starts by removing these big windows uh, from the opera house with a 16-foot ladder and, uh, and some help. Typically, these are quite heavy. Uh, removing the window stops and, and carefully removing the windows. Of course, the windows are marked to make sure they go back in the same opening. Um, and carefully get them down onto the floor where they can then be, uh, make it safely to the truck and back to the shop. So of course after the windows are out, plywood needs to be installed. Usually that kind of has to be custom cut depending on how square the openings still are and so forth. Uh, but anyway, that allows you to, you know, of course, plug the hole and weatherize and also to be able to remove the plywood if you have to go back and do any work to the opening, which they all need painting at a minimum and, and more extensive repairs for some of the others. This is a picture in the shop. These are windows that have just come back to the shop and they're just, just you know, back to the shop safe and uh, ready to be restored. Um, you could kind of see, I'm not sure how well, but you know, just how grungy everything is. A lot of these panels are in really poor condition. Um, and, and just, you have to completely, completely restore the whole window. So here's a picture of that same window, some of the work being done. There was siding rot that was related to the sill. This is the new sill installed. These are all pieces that I make at the shop and come, come back to the building and install. You know, some, a lot of work on site. Some sides of the, what they call the jam, which is the, the box that the window sits in, also rotten down here. And then the trim will also, it's not done yet, but the trim is repaired. So most of them didn't need that extensive a repair, but that's, that's a pretty common thing that I deal with, rotten window sills. People may have had that in their own house. Um, and here's one of the bare window frames after the panels have been removed. This one is in pretty poor condition, a lot of rot. Um, that one may be a candidate to just be reproduced completely uh, or repaired, depending on, a lot of times the rot is right around a joint and depending how rotten it is going up either side, you kind of make a call about whether or not to restore or to replace. So here's, here's one of the stained glass panels that's been very carefully removed from the frame because these are, you know, they're 130 years old. And what you can see here is that the stained glass panels, you have all the numerous pieces of glass. And in between that is the leading, also known as caming. Um, and that type of caming has a lifespan of around 100 years. So this, uh, you know, th these windows are, are kind of past their, their service life, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and what happens is they oxidize, the, the leading gets thin and brittle. This is some leading right here, actually, these pieces. Um, but it just, it just starts to, to just tear, to just fall apart, you know. And so the window is slowly disintegrating. The glass is fine unless it's broken, but uh, the leading just just finally gives up. So at this point, everything is marked. You can see all the stained glass is marked with masking tape because it's going to go back into the exact same spot unless it's broken and is replaced with a with a match. Um, you have to carefully mark everything so it's it goes right back where it started. This is another one similar. This is one of the upper panels, also just falling apart. Um, so removing those from the window is a challenge. Though they're just simply nothing holding them together essentially and you have to very carefully slide them out of the frame onto a piece of plywood and slowly get them into position where you can, where you can start disassembling. So here's a new panel under construction. So what happens here, if, if you look back at this panel, is that each one of these is marked and so you start disassembling. For the most part, a lot of it can just be pulled apart. It's really just falling apart. Some of it has to be snipped, uh, being careful not to break any glass. And what I do is piece by piece, remove a piece and clean it. And then it goes over where it's starting to be rebuilt. This is the new leading, all of the new leading. And here's the stained glass pieces. I've set up a place to work here that's, that's a square. There's pieces tacked on that form a nice square. And you start working out of one corner 
with the panel and just keep working your way, removing pieces from the old one, cleaning the glass, making sure there's no issues with the glass, cleaning it and reassembling over on your, your little reassembly area. Uh, carefully cutting these pieces of, of leading. These come in six foot lengths that can be snipped mostly by using these. Look just like regular cutters, but they're, they're actually specialized for this. They do a very nice clean cut and uh, you have to measure pieces very carefully to go in. You know, there's numerous, this, you know, this is a piece, this is a piece, this is a separate piece, this is a piece, you know, it, it, there's lots and lots of pieces in there. Um, so, uh, and actually one interesting note with the, with the leading or the caming, these pieces that come at six feet, uh, <laughs> before you start cutting pieces out of them, one of the best things that you could do with them is actually stretch them some. They're, they're, they're made from lead, and uh, mostly lead, and then there's tin and copper and a few other alloys added in there uh, to make this material. But by stretching it, you actually, it's fairly, fairly soft. You could, you know, as it comes out of the box, it's very easy to just bend it around. Uh, but you clamp one end to the, to the workbench, and the other end you have a, a tool, I actually had a homemade tool that I'd made for doing it, but you're able to stretch it, and the whole piece will stretch uh, a good half inch or three quarters, even though it's metal, but it'll stretch about three quarters, and at the same time, it, you know, it kind of goes, makes it nice and straight, takes out any, uh, any little bends in it, and actually stiffens it a hair. So that's, uh, th that's an interesting part of working with the caming. So anyway, that panel uh, is under construction. This is another panel under construction. You can see all the pieces are being transferred from one over to here. Mostly what I do is actually just put an arrow on this masking tape to make sure that I'm oriented correctly down to the corner. What holds the pieces together at the joints? Well, I'll, uh, I'm going to be getting to that. Uh, yeah, eventually they're soldered. Once the panel, once the panel is constructed, uh, every joint, every single joint is then soldered with a soldering iron. Uh, this, is, this is the type of soldering iron you use for that type of work. Um, and so, let me see here. So, here's one of the transom panels. And this panel is completely assembled. Uh, and this one has actually been soldered, like I said. So every joint is soldered using the solder. And you use flux a little bit to help the solder attach. Uh, but every single joint is soldered. Then you flip the whole panel and solder all of the joints from the other side. This panel, it might be hard to see way back there, but there are some little nails that were driven in after the panel was constructed to kind of make sure it's all held precisely where you want it before you start soldering. Uh, but every joint is soldered front and back. And the panel at that time is not, is not stiff at all. It really is not stiff. Everything is it is one unit at that time, but it's, if you were to just grab it by the top and go like this, it'll just kind of, flood, you know, it's, uh, and the reason for that is that the whole panel has to be cemented. And this is a picture of basically the ingredients for cement, which, which I make, or, or most stained glass people make themselves. Um, it's, uh, I'm trying to think if I can remember the, the exact Things. But this is plaster of Paris, boiled linseed oil, and the white bag is what they call whiting. In the, in the window industry or stained glass world, they call it whiting. It's actually uh, powdered or pulverized limestone. And then turpentine as a thinner, and Portland cement, the same as you would make cement with. So um, I got that recipe, this same recipe for, from a couple of different people, one of them being uh, Larry Rebecca down in Burlington. I'm not sure if any of you folks know the stained glass shop down on Pine Street in Burlington. Uh, and he told me uh, that apparently this basic recipe goes back to the Middle Ages, uh, or at least the, the basic ingredients. Um, I'm sure they weren't in a DAP container then, but uh, you know, it was uh, that this same basic ingredient list was, uh, has been the same for centuries. So this is all mixed together 
in, in the correct parts until you come to a consistency somewhat similar to maybe peanut butter, maybe soft, pretty, pretty soft peanut butter. And unfortunately, I, I don't have, I should have had either my mother if she was in the shop or, or somebody else passing through take a picture of me when I was in the process of cementing the panels because it's a very messy process. Um, and for a while you think you're ruining everything <laughs> because uh, what happens is after you mix up this, this paste, this cement, you start spreading it all over the panel, basically all over the panel. And you take a scrub brush similar to what you, or just like what you would use maybe for scrubbing the bathtub or something that has the, the plastic bristles that stick out. And you essentially just start working this material all over the panel. And what it does is force the cement into the caming. So these pictures here, you know, here's the leading or the caming with glass on either side. It's shaped like a channel, so there's a channel on either side. This picture here shows how there's a space. There's a space in there, and that's where the cement needs to go. Um, and actually, this interesting tool called the FID <laughs> uh, is used to help open up the caming. The stained glass is not, well, it runs fairly true in thickness, but a lot of times it varies some. It's not the same as regular clear glass. It's a, being textured uh, and stuff, it, it tends to change in thickness a fair amount. So you want some room for that cement to, 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 to go in there. So you force it in, you do one whole side with this material. The whole panel literally looks like you've wasted God only knows how much time and ruined the whole thing. But uh, you start using whiting. You use a lot of whiting for this process. You start using whiting, which is of course part of the ingredient, to you put it on and start soaking up the excess and cleaning off the excess scrub more, more whiting applied. It slowly starts to clean away the cement, you know, and it's got some oil in it and stuff, so it's, it's, it's sort of soaking up all of the excess. And basically you continue to do that, application after application, until eventually, you know, with a, with a brush, you're working a brush and, and, and just kind of working it that way. And eventually, this is what you have. It actually ends up being really nice and clear and polished. It, it, it all comes away. The cement that's left is just inside the channels that you can't see. And it, it, has, it, it serves, I think, three different problems. Well, definitely one process is to weatherize it if this is a panel that's going to be outside. No water can make it through the, the stained glass panel. The second is uh, it actually adds a nice patina to the whole panel. It's no longer the shiny caming that you see here because of the Portland cement and some of the other stuff. And it's very, very small grit material. Uh, so it actually kind of polishes both the glass and makes the caming kind of take on this aged patina that looks really nice. Uh, so when you're done both sides, and it's quite a process, uh, then you lay out or stand the panel up somewhere where it's nice and flat and let it sit. And uh, by the next day, actually even at that point, and the cement's not even hard, but just by filling all those channels, all of a sudden it's quite a bit stiffer. But if you, uh, uh, the next day, the next day that panel will be all of a sudden quite rigid and actually quite strong, and it really makes quite a difference that way. This picture here may not be hard to see from way back there, but there are actually some wires soldered on every so often, here, here, and here. And those will come into play a little later. Um, this is myself putting one of the panels back into a restored and, and primed window frame that's ready to, to accept the panels and has been repaired. And so, this is a transom panel. You can probably see a little better here. There's some black round quarter inch rods that it go into the window frame on either side and then those wires are twisted around the rod and those are, are uh, additional support for the frame once it's in the sash. Um, these windows actually have sort of a, a little bit of an old school setup in terms of almost being like insulated windows and, and that's because the window frame 
It has the stained glass panel on the inside, but there is actually in front of each stained glass panel another clear uh, storm pane. Uh, and so that, that definitely helps, I'm sure, with our value, but it also protects these panels. These panels, unless that, pan that storm panel is broken, these panels never really get touched by the rain or anything, and I'm sure that's helped them to, to survive. Um, Maybe that happened 30 years ago? What's that? That's not a new thing? No, no, thing. That's, the way, that's the way they were. Uh, the, uh, the, clear stain, uh, the clear storm panes, or what I call the storm panes, um, all of the original ones, anyway, were the old, if, anybody, if, if any of you folks have ever seen the old style wavy glass that you run into occasionally, um, and it's got other slight imperfections in it that were common at that time. Uh, those were all that type of glass. The windows, you know, any of that were original window frames were made that way right from the start. So it was, uh, it adds quite a bit of weight. These windows, I don't, I never weighed one of them, but when they're reassembled, each half is pretty, pretty darn heavy. Um, a lot of glass, a lot of leading. Um, they're, they're, uh, you definitely don't want to try to put them in alone. <laughs> um, so this is a picture of two restored window openings from the outside. Uh, these panels have been re, you know, have been re, rest well, restored or remade. So, and, yep. So, um, there's a layer of, of clear glass. Yep. Piece? Yep, right on the outside here. Yep, each one, and then you've got the divider. So right here, right here, right here, here, and then in front of that, there's just a clear, pane of glass on the outside. So do all stained glass windows have I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I think that this is, uh, you know, they, they probably looked ahead and said, you know, not only is that warmer, but that really helps to protect the inside windows to not have to deal with the actual exterior. Yeah, or uh, kids throwing rocks. Right, or anything. Um, so it was a pretty good, it's a pretty, I think it was a pretty good system. Uh, the only problem sometimes is that uh, and I remember when I was working on these windows 10 years ago, particularly on the front of the building, there was places where if there was broken glass or some place where things could get in there, there were times where there was probably this deep in ladybugs or flies, you know, that had gone in there and just, you know, generation after generation uh, had, had piled up in there. It was pretty, pretty disgusting. Um, but so yeah, it's it was a good it's a good system. But you don't I don't believe you see that all the time. And actually, I, the stained glass work for me is actually something fairly new. I'm fairly new to this. I actually started doing it for this job. <laughs> so I'm not, uh, you know, I don't really have extensive extensive stained glass experience building. You know, I'm sure everybody's seen uh, numerous uh, stained glass panels in churches, really ornate. Uh, stuff like that, that would definitely make me stop and have to, you know, get a little more skilled, I think. But these, you know, these windows being mostly straight lines, you know, they're mostly straight lines. You've got some curved work to do at the tops, but I was comfortable, I was comfortable with the soldering before I started, comfortable from years of woodworking with cutting things precisely. And, uh, you know, sort of not afraid, wasn't, wasn't afraid to kind of tackle this project. And um, it, it really was a, was a great learning experience. And these, these were all pine. These were all pine sash, pine frames. Um, in New England, that's the most common, you know, being the most common wood, you know, it's, a, it's an easy milling, uh, especially the older pine was fairly rot resistant too, um, you know, so, so it's a pretty good wood. Uh, Douglas fir is another one, but that, that one, uh, Doug fir probably would have been available by the, by the 1890s here, but that was more of a Western, a Western wood. Uh, but yeah, fine, fine lumber. So. Uh, yeah, the mortars and tendon joints are much easier to make in pine than something. Well, they, they are, I mean, I've had to, I've had to, um, you know, from like you saw the, the hard maple, entry doors that I made, you know, work with hardwood a lot. You know, your tooling, how sharp your tooling is, how sharp your, you know, both how well your stuff is set up, um, it makes all the difference. But uh, it, yeah, it is easier to mill softwood, for sure. 
Um, so actually back to this, uh, one last step after these panels go into a frame, they're actually then with, with regular window glazing putty uh, where, where the frame meets the, the wood sash all the way around. Uh, glazing putty is applied to that at a 45 or at, a, at, a, at an angle. And uh, glazing, glazing points are used every so often to make sure that the panel is secured in there well, plus the rods. And then the storm pane has the same treatment. That's, that's held in and puttied as well. So there's quite a bit of putty work to do too. Um, and then, you know, that basically, that basically is, you're, you're ready to paint. At that time, you're finally, finally ready to paint the windows. They were kind of a reddish color on the outside, kind of a brown on the inside. And they can go back in. But as I said earlier, with that half round window, all of these go back. I'll take the whole set back and go through the process of essentially putting them in like they were going in because there's various supports and things that have to be cut and you don't want to be doing that when they're finished, you know. So if you can go down with a frame that has no glass in it, no anything in it, easy to handle, lightweight, has been repaired so that you know it's the way it's going to be, bring them down to the building and fit everything, usually do some work to the opening at the same time, and then bring the windows back and continue, you know, getting ready to put the panels in. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very labor intensive process. Here's a picture a little bit closer of some of the panels. Um, so most of the glass was original or, you know, was not broken in these, a certain amount always is, but uh, I usually go to the stained glass studios and you carefully try to match. It is possible to have stained glass made to match yours, but uh, usually is out of the scope of cost because it's not only does it take forever to get it, but it's ridiculously expensive, sort of. <laughs> so you can usually get a very close match. There's a few, you know, there's some pieces in here that have been changed and it's quite hard to tell. So you just have to kind of have an eye for, for matching the glass and making sure that that all looks correct. And the texture also, stained glass has many different textures. This is a piece here. This, this glass isn't overly textured. It does have some texture, but some stained glass is bumpy or looks like little, little divots in it and all kinds of different stuff. <clears throat> but it, you know, it, it, any texture really adds to kind of a nice look and, and you, you can't really see directly through them, but you can see the color nicely. So and there's another, there's really only two, there's really only two different colors used in the opera house, the yellow, uh, and they sh both colors share a lot of the same color within the yellow and kind of the, it's sort of a purplish brown color. Uh, so there's, there's a few different colors there. So that's the, that's the basics of uh, today's presentation. Um, you know, the Opera House, uh, the, the weeds have had a fair amount. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with uh, sterling weed. You ever know Sterling Weed, Weed's Imperial Orchestra? Yep. Uh, he was my grandfather's uncle. So, uh, and he lived to the ripe old age of 105, I think. He died in tw uh, 2004 or five. Um, but his, you know, his, his band, Weed's Imperial Orchestra, has played, you know, since some of the early days of the Opera House played there. Uh, numerous times, my great grandfather and, and uh, great uncle or great great uncle were in that band as well. Um, my, you know, uh, of course, school functions and stuff like that. Uh, my parents also played music there a lot with their bluegrass band. I've played there before, playing uh, both trumpet and and uh, rock and roll. But uh, so the, the Opera House for us, there's quite a bit of family history there. Uh, and also my father working on the building years back um, and then myself working on it two different times. So it's, uh, you know, and having gone there for just numerous, numerous functions. Um, so it's really a great space. You know, anybody who's never been there, I'd recommend going there. You know, it's the last couple of years, it's, there hasn't been much going on. It was sort of worked out perfect in terms of a lot of the work being done to the building uh, when it was sort of closed during COVID and all that. But uh, um, they're kind of coming back online now and there's, there's a fair amount of stuff going on there. 
So, so uh, the the uh, those, uh, no, usually you're able to, to carry them one at a time, one at a time out of the building. You know, one or two people, depending on how, how they need to be handled, carefully laid in the back of my truck, you know, or a trailer if need be. And uh, I only live, where I live is uh, only about a mile and a half from the Opera House. I live in the, the village of Venus, well, just outside the village of Venusburg. Um, so this job for me was, was nice and close. And, um, but yeah, usually the stained glass panels, if they were removed and you wanted to try to move them, you'd probably need to crate them up or something. But as long as the frames are holding together enough to, you kind of have to make that decision as you're, as you're working. Um, you can trans get them in the truck and get them home. So that, but yeah, I did want to you know open up open up the floor to any questions. Is there a side market for stained glass windows? I think you I think you run into uh, stained glass windows at a lot of the salvage places quite often. I mean, uh, in this case, like with what I was doing, as you disassemble these panels, you know. I think there is a market for stained glass panels, like stained glass units that are made and came out of something. I, I actually worked last summer removing some really beautiful stained glass windows from uh, the now torn down and gone uh, West Enosburg Methodist Church. They hired me to safely remove these windows because window stuff is, you know, it, it's, if, you, if you're not familiar with removing windows and kind of dealing with windows in general, it can be a challenge. Um, so we removed those, and, uh, but they already had people lined up. You know, it was, these were really nice, probably seven foot tall, ornate, you know, various, you know, what was that? What did somebody say something? Oh, sorry. Uh, so, and, and those had already been advertised and a number of local people and I think maybe one or two people from, from out, of, uh, out of the area bought them immediately basically because they're, they're just these beautiful uh, 18, those were probably from the 1880s. Um, so I think there's a market. I mean, stuff like that as a conversation piece or something in your home would, is, uh, I'm sure there's quite a market for that, yeah. yeah. The, um the metal that you use, is that, it's not just pure lead? No, it's the, the, the caming is... Did you say you stretch it? Yeah, you do. They come in six foot lengths, and you, you, you secure one end, and on the other end, you, you, you grab a hold of it. There's tools for it. Um, uh, and you actually stretch it some, both to straighten it and to stiffen it a little bit. Yeah. It's good for 100 years. Yep. What about these old churches? Do you know anything about them? I mean, well, I think those. Churches, the have been yeah, I know, I know. I, I, you know, that's a good question. Uh, this type, I know, this type of letting. That's what I was told. That's what the what Larry Rebecca, who's uh, who's probably the Vermont's preeminent uh, stained glass uh, guy, said. Uh, was about a hundred years, and I read that as well. So I'm not sure with the older ones whether it's a. Uh, you know, today's, today's caming is very similar to the old stuff, but I think it, the alloys and stuff they're able to put in it make it easier to work and easier to solder and stuff, but it, the, old, the old leading may actually have been more pure lead, and that tends to last a long time. So I'm not sure if that, I'm not sure if that is a difference, you know, with, with, with how long they can last. I know those windows, you know, like on some of these old medieval churches and stuff, they need attention every so often too. You know, they have to be re-cemented, they need repair, um, nothing lasts forever type thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, two things. Uh, first of all, the Opera House of Plug, if you've never been there, uh, it has a reputation for having some really good acoustics. Yep. And this is not coming from a non-musician, but uh, uh, John Gallimard was her Vermont uh, folk singer. On there one time when I had been going, and, and he had been told that the acoustics were really good. And uh, he remarked on that uh, as he was going through his performance. He says, this, this really is a wonderful thing. So if you've never been there, especially for musical performances, it's going to be acoustic music, not so much rock and roll, but the acoustic music, and you will not be disappointed, unless the musicians are bad. <laughs> and secondly, a uh, question for Mr. Reed. Yeah. Uh, as you were embarking on this stuff, you must have had to do a fair amount of research. So who were the resources that you 
went through to check on for materials and, and techniques. In terms of getting ready to do the stained glass yes, work? Yes. Well, it was a combination. I mean, some of it, some of it was uh, talking to people I'd already worked with, like Phil and Carolyn Bronze, who are people who've done stained glass in the area for a long time, and I'd worked with them a little bit doing restoration 10 years ago. Uh, so they, they were definitely a resource. And then buying materials and also talking with Larry Rebecca down on Pine Street in Burlington, he was, you know, as I said, he's, you know, he, he is a true, stained glass expert. I mean, he really has done it for 40 years, uh, making all kinds of amazing, well, restoring, doing lots of restoration, but also creating really intricate uh, stained glass panels. Uh, so yeah, it was a combination of what I already knew, talking to people who knew what they were doing, and uh, you know, obviously some reading literature and, and online and stuff, and kind of making sure I was doing everything correctly. But. You know, as I said before, most of it, I felt pretty comfortable about it. I've done a lot of soldering, you know, whether it was plumbing, wiring, you know, uh, automotive type soldering with wire, uh, stuff like that. So I was comfortable, comfortable with most of the processes, comfortable cutting and handling glass, of course. You know, I've done a lot of that. Uh, working, of course, anything to do with the windows otherwise. So I, essentially just felt comfortable to tackle it because really this is, this is, this really for the most part is the extent of my stained glass uh, experience was doing this job, you know, deciding to say, yeah, I can, you know, I can, I can rebuild any of these panels that need to be rebuilt or rebuilt. Uh, so that was, you know, mostly just kind of dove in head first, you know, uh, kind of similar with when I started the business actually too. I, I, uh, the shop was there, my mother used it, but it was in need of some upgrades and stuff and was, was happily working as a mechanic, but started to kind of have the desire to work with wood and maybe start, you know, and of course to be able to work right there on the family property. Um, and, and really just sort of switched gears, you know, just really kind of made that decision and, uh, you know, gave a couple months notice at, at the garage and uh, started in. You know, it was really a, really kind of just dove right in there, you know? And uh, some of the first windows that I ever made and doors actually were for the shop. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things you, you know, kind of confident enough about your abilities and you're gonna have some time to, you know, I mean, now looking back on it almost 20 years later, it's kind of like, <laughs> okay, you know? But, uh, but it's worked out, you know, it's worked out. And the restoration has become quite a bit larger part of the business over the years. Uh, the first probably eight to 10 years was a little bit more like maybe what my father had done. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of windows, storm windows, uh, multi-light windows, uh, doors, storm doors, uh, you know, most anything that was, was a custom woodworking project. But the restoration work that's been the last 10, 10 to 12 years, the restoration work has become more and more of what I do. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of grant money out there. You know, a lot of organizations are, are, you know, both the Masonic Hall that I was showing there. Most of these projects really kind of aren't, aren't doable without that money. You know, the, the community, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's gonna be tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, so usually some of these historic preservation grants really help to make that possible for, for organizations or, uh, or towns. So there, there's kind of been a lot of that going on. Oh, sorry. Yep. I, I was just wondering how long the whole project took you. Uh, the whole, uh, all of the windows, the whole project. Uh, and there were, if I go back, way back, um, to a picture of the Opera House. Yeah, okay, so here, I also did these windows as well. Uh, we've been focusing on the main, the main windows, but there were some here and there's the same just around the corner, some just like that. Uh, so the whole, well, it's a little hard to see because this project started kind of right in the middle of the pandemic, uh, 2021 or 2020. Um, it got, it, got pretty, it got chopped up some, and I actually did remote schooling with my kids during the 2020 school year. Uh, so it's kind of not fair to say how it, 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 
you know, the whole project, I think if you, typically with jobs like this, you aren't working on them necessarily every minute of the day until they're done. They tend to, you know, the, the grants have a start and end date to them. Uh, you have to have all the work completed by X date, but it's usually quite a span of time for you to get that work completed. Uh, so usually I have other shops or other jobs that I have to do as well. Uh, and at the same time, mixed into that is doing the restoration work. So, uh, but a good example probably is per opening, probably per opening is around 50 or 60 hours. Yeah, if, it's, if you're doing, when I had to fully rebuild the panels, all the way through, that's about what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you use the word grant several times. Yep. I'm assuming that you know how to write this grant. <laughs> well, I'm not the one who secured the grants. So I, I, I have to bid on the job. And then so the, the organization, the Opera House, would have wrote the grant or had somebody write the grant for them. And just writing a grant is no, no uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to get the grant money either. Usually you're competing against other opera houses or, or build. Some insight into where it's going up. Sure. Yeah, well, I usually, I usually end up being involved oftentimes because, uh, like with the Masonic Hall or some of these other organizations, they'll come to me first to get a baseline of what it's going to cost. And that oftentimes is used as numbers in the grant request. You know, when you're talking about the building needs X amount for window restoration, you know, they probably have a quote from painters or painter. Um, so you kind, you kind of are involved a little bit, but, but at that point, you're actually not guaranteed the work because after the grant is available, they usually have to go out to bid. And sometimes, sometimes there may only be one bidder. This, there, uh, there honestly is not that many people out there doing this. Um, Can you come out and uh, uh, give estimates? Uh, or say uh, town wanted to fix a window in the church yep. or something? Yep, yeah, yeah, usually do, uh, you know, we'll meet up and walk through and do that. I was just doing that over in Franklin. I've got some work to do for, for the town of Franklin on their old town hall. Um, but usually that's the process, you know. They're, if they're looking to go the route of grants, usually you need some figures to start that grant process. And that they'll usually contact somebody like myself to give them that baseline, yeah. you know, so, and yeah. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of them do. I know the Masonic Hall, uh, I think maybe the Paul Brun grant. I don't know if it had to be a match on that. I don't know if you would know that, Jim, yeah, or not. Typically, they do. They were, yeah. Um, but yeah, usually, usually they are like a 50-50. But still, it makes a you know makes a huge difference. Um, I know the Masonic Hall is that that current job. They're, you know, I think it's 50-50 grant money and in, in their own money. So, um, but. Yes. Yeah. Um, when you build a new window, do you attempt to treat it for rot? Typically, the, the, no, I mean, and again, that's one of those best practice things where, you know, if it's not something that they were doing originally, you're usually going to do it the same way. Of course, you don't have access to, you've probably heard the term old growth, old growth timber, you know, uh, which, which was superior. I think mostly for the reason because of its size. And the reason I say that is that, you know, if you kind of know what it looks like on the inside of a tree, there's, a, there's sort of the living, what they call the sapwood underneath the bark, that's X thickness, varies different species. And then the whole center of the tree that's not dead, it's still, but that's the heartwood. And heartwood in general on almost any species is much more rot resistant than the sapwood just because of the, whatever the process is that takes place when it stops being the heartwood or stops being the, the sapwood and, and moving water up and down the tree and becoming the heartwood where it's there for structure but it's not really doing anything anymore. Like with pine, the heartwood is usually quite pink colored and sapwood will be kind of whitish colored. And so the, the point of all that is that when I do window work, I almost exclusively use heartwood, especially for any type of bottom rails, um, you know, like this picture here. Um, 
you know, this frame. When this frame is rebuilt or reproduced, I, you know, I'll, every piece is kind of chose for, for where it's gonna be used. Some pieces that, uh, that would be the bottom of the window. This, this rail up here, that's a rail that lives a pretty easy life and if there was some sapwood in there, you're really not gonna have an issue, but down where it sits on the windowsill, it, it makes all the difference in the world. It took me a little while to learn that, actually. Um, you know, and now at 20 years, I think I had some storm windows I made when I very first started, and a few of them were rotten. They were in a tough spot anyway, but were rotten on the bottom. And I said, <laughs> you know, have I been doing this that long, you know? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I remember repairing those and I could tell when I cut into that wood that it was wood I wouldn't use now for that rail. You know, I wouldn't have used, it had a lot of sapwood in it. it, had a lot of sapwood in it, and that's, you know, I wouldn't have done it. So, you know, live and learn with that. But, uh, so no, there's not really any treatments. Yeah. So that is something you've done painting from time to time. Does that wood, that hardwood, take the paint differently than the uh, Well. I, th I think if you, yes, a little bit. Not, I mean, with paint, you're not gonna see it so much. With stain, you definitely can see it. If you've ever stained pine, you know, uh, and you brush it on, you'll notice, oh man, there's spots where it's like, seems like it's soaked right in, and other spots where it kind of is sitting on the surface, and when you wipe it off, it'll kind of be splotchy and not, not the same, and a lot of times you see that. The, the sapwood definitely seems, is more porous, I'm sure that's why it, sucks, you know, holds the water and starts to rot. And uh, what they call blue stain and some of, the, some of the other things they get going before it really starts to turn to rot, really doesn't like to get going in heartwood. So there's like a definite, a definite difference there. But as far as painting, you know, with, with my work, everything has oil-based paint for, for the primer. And then a good quality, you know, two coats of latex that the, the top coat goes over the putty, lapped onto the glass a little bit. You've probably done that yourself. Um, and you usually, one thing with windows, this is not the greatest picture, but the sides of the windows, uh, you, you typically do not want to paint the sides of the windows that go against the jam that actually allows moisture, any moisture that might start getting into the wood, a place to, a place to get out in a place where they're not continuing to be wet so it can act like a, you know, a, a, a place for the moisture to get out, essentially, that's what it is. Um, so that's interesting as well. Any other questions? Anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.